Welcome to tonight's episode of Profound States. Tonight, we have a very special guest. Her name is Misha Johnston. She is a certified hypnotherapist specializing in multidimensional ET experiencer regressions, past life regressions, and trauma recovery hypnosis. She offers galactic multidimensional sessions and is a trance channel who speaks many galactic light languages. She facilitates virtual experiencer support groups three times a week on Zoom and in her home once a month. She started the first teen and parents and children's support groups in the United States in 1990, owner of UFO Night Watch Airbnb tour experiences in Las Vegas. Uh, she's a third generational experiencer having contact with eight different types of extraterrestrials, uh, including, oh, I don't have the answer to that one. She's the author of, that one kind of trails off, She's the author of Covert Abduction, harassment, uh, Military Harassment, Surveillance, Interrogation, and Mind Control, and They Weren't Butterflies, a Monarch Survivor Story, uh, also Galactic Planetary Genealogy, and ET Experiencer. Uh, my mother is calling. How bizarre. Uh, she would call me during the middle of this. Uh, and ET Experiencer, an unimaginable Oracle decks with companion book. Uh, all is available on Amazon.com. And uh, for more information on Misha, Misha uh, Johnston, visit her website, www.starseedawakening.org. Uh, welcome to tonight's show, Misha. It's a pleasure. Well, thank you so much for having me on, Charles. It's an honor to be here. Uh, well, uh, go ahead and jump right into your story. Uh, Okay. Tell us about, well, before we get into your ET or mind control or anything, uh, let's start at the very beginning. Okay. What was the very first interesting, weird, strange, or any type of odd experience that happened to you in your youth, if anything? Uh, well, okay. So I'm a picture person uh, because Galactic's... Uh, speak to me in pictures um i like to i like to share a picture so um Go right ahead okay so can you see that i can we okay. can you you can't see we can we can oh, you can perfect perfect okay so this was my first encounter uh and when i was a child um uh, I would hear these clicky, not click, I would hear these uh, little kind of squeaky voices, uh, like little my mouses or something like that. And um, so one early morning hours in the, it was just getting dawn. Um, I, and I was only, you know, I was uh, three years old when I had this first encounter and I went in to find where they were now my sister and I shared a bedroom and she was still asleep and so I went and got out of my bed and went in to because I could hear that and I followed the sound and followed the sound went underneath the staircase and this is just how it looked I saw these in this energy it was kind of like a, a glow of energy around I saw these three little beings uh furry looking and little brown eyes and little, actually a, a smile on their face and and they looked very pleasant I had little hoods on and um at that time I didn't really communicate with them but later on I did so this was my first time seeing them and they became my invisible friends so many 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 children have invisible friends which are actually our ET guides or our little ET friends how, and so, how, how old were you and where three. were you I was three in Idaho. In Idaho. And where in Idaho? Uh, in, and in this particular time, it was, it was Blackfoot. I, well, actually, it was Shelley, Idaho. Shelley. Okay, go ahead. Uh -huh. Shelley, Idaho. Yeah, so, um, and it's a rural area. So, these little guys were with me for, at, off and on, for like, till I was four or five, right, in that area age and they were my little um invisible friends that would take me flying over the roofs of the of the uh houses to go up to the ship i have no memory of their ship at all um i, I mean i've not done any any regression work on them because 
they were just really positive experience and I just loved them. <laughs> what, what did they look like and how tall were they? Well, and... I'll tell you what they look like alone in it in a second with the second picture. Okay. All right. So then um, I uh, so they would levitate me uh, over the ho uh, houses and such as that to go up to sure. the ship. And then um, they were I called them BGs, the bears, because to me they look like bears. And when I grew up. I saw the Ewoks, and that's what they look like, is the Ewoks, 100% like the Ewoks. And I've met many people since then that have also had en encounters with these little furry feature fellows. Now, this particular picture is a an old uh, picture of an actual, what we were, what I call BGs, m the movies call Ewoks. And but this is the actual picture of him. That's how the movie got their idea from is this actual being. As you can see, he's got a little a white kind of belly there and such as that. And he's a slightly different, but so that's what the Hollywood came up with. Do you know any context of the photo? This one? Yes, it's a, it's a man I work with all the time, a whistleblower, Jimmy Payne. You can find his stories on uh, not only my old broad, my old radio broadcasts, uh, but on um, Super Soldier dot uh, Super Soldier Talk. So his name is J. Is, how do you spell his name? James Ring. Oh, James thought, Ring's show. Uh, I, I, Super Soldier Talk is the right, show. I, you said Jimmy oh, Payne. Oh, Jimmy Payne. That is a alias. Yes, Jimmy Payne. He's a man in black. He used to be a man in black. Uh, and so he is coming out with his uh, whistle. So that's, a that's not his real name. No, no. Uh, so will he ever release his real name? I doubt it. OK, go ahead. Yeah. All right. So that's that picture and such. So then um, I had the encounters with him, like I said, for, for about a year. And then um, I had these types of ETs that were my gray, uh, like I called them the little doctors when I was four. And the little doctors would be three of them and they would come to my window. And um, they looked like what I thought they looked like were deers peeking through my window. And so it became so common for me to have these experiences. I, I'd see the three little deers at the window and I would know it was time to go. And my main, uh, who was, shall we say, over or in charge of these three little greys was what I called the, a tall white or my willow one, willowy one. And I called him willowy because he was very, very slender, very skinny, quite tall, you know, for me as a, a you know, a baby of four years old. But I do believe he was somewhere between um, close to six feet tall, maybe even over, but at, at least six feet tall. And so you went from three years of age to six years. Is this at age four or age six? This is age about five, then moving into six. Because okay. between four, it's it's very hard to absolutely have it. But I know for th from three years old, I had the BGs, and then I had the willowy one and the grays, uh, the little doctors, were from between four to four years old. They, they started. But this willowy one was uh, to stay in my life and all the way through uh, until I became an adult and, and went into puberty and everything. And this was the one that took me into one of my hybrid programs that I was part of. So uh, it, does this, what was the height of this one? Sorry, six feet, just okay, about six and feet. The, uh, male, female, it's female, right? You know, no, I felt it was a he. Okay, and, and he, uh, he did take me to the nursery where I did see females, but he was. Did you get a, a name? No. Okay, go ahead. Um, and uh, I, I, that's what I call him, the willowy one. That was okay. his, his name. And so um, the next experience that I had was um, at, and so the, it kind of on and off, how, um, the contact goes is they'll come for maybe oh, a solid 
week or two weeks or even a month off and on quite frequently. And then you might not see them for years, um, especially since uh, they'd already checked in on me. I I'd, I'd connected with my other ETs, the, the, the willowy one and then the grays and stuff. So I would have experiences that just periodically would happen, maybe every year, every two years, such as that. Um, but then the next one that I really is a, a very constant memory is um, I was 16 years old and I went to bed and I woke up in a field with this huge ship around me. Now I felt it was round. That was the feeling that I got, but I was paralyzed like you will get paralyzed in these experiences. So I couldn't move anything except for my eyes. So I looked up and was able to see that and uh, some lights that were moving around on it. Uh, so you were paralyzed? Yes, just standing there. I was standing there paralyzed. At the age of 16? Yes. Mm -hmm. Where were you? That was in Idaho. Uh, you're still in the same little s suburban city? No, no, actually, it, that, was, that was in Arco, Idaho. Oh, oh. I, sorry, that wasn't Arco. That was in Blackfoot. That was in Blackfoot, Idaho. Blackfoot, okay. Mm -hmm. Do they have Blackfoot Indians there? They actually do, but they have more Shoshone. Uh, uh, why would they be called Blackfoot? If <laughs> it, because of the hot springs. The hot springs had black on the bottom of them. And um, when the Indians would come out, their black footprints. Ah. <laughs> that's how Blackfoot got its name, their black footprints. So it's practical. Okay. It is, yeah, that's how it got its name. Go on. So um, I love your questions. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, and so then um, the next, I don't remember anything except that I feel like there's something behind me. I can sense that there's something very tall behind me. Now I'm at this time, you know, probably five foot five or something like that. But it was much, it felt much, much taller than that. So I went in, uh, I went ahead. Next thing I memory is I'm, I wake up and I'm laying on a table and there's these little, uh, and I'm very naive. I have to tell you, I'm a very naive and I've never had a gynecological examination from a doctor or anything like that. And um, I, they start giving me some kind of a gynecological examination down there. And it's like really it's freaking me out. And I start getting nervous. And then this tall white one comes in. Uh, not comes in he's standing above me and he leans over and looks in my eyes and telepathically tells me um this is necessary for the hybrid program we are not going to harm you so um i was kind of relaxing a little bit because of, he always relaxed me and he, the, the telepathic messages and imageries that i would get with from him were quite amazing um in fact there was one I'm going to just go away from this story for just a second because it, it's in my head, so I might not, I might forget it if I don't. Uh, an, another time that uh, I was on board the ship, and I was a teenager, so I probably around this age, maybe, maybe a, a bit older, I don't know, but I was shown by him these holographic screens, and it was definitely Earth, and Earth was going through some kind of a transition through every holographic image that changed it went into it was a beautiful earth and then a, a beautiful uh, uh then there was you know generations and generations and as the more we got into the 20th century the worse everything started getting until until the, he showed me the end result which was a devastated planet with no foliage with no life with cloned information only um oh sure and uh let me see how to stop that <laughs> that's why i didn't stop that so. i don't want to close myself uh, can you stop me i don't know how to stop myself here uh does it say share screen on the bottom there is that gone now no uh, no. Click share screen on the bottom again. See if it, there it uh, is. Stop. Stop share screen. I did have one more picture to show you, but that's OK. I'll go back to it. Yeah, you can come back to it. OK. OK, now you are. Am I good? I'm no, you're you. still sharing. 
Oh, I had to confirm stop sharing. OK, there we go. Right okay. All right, continue with your story now. OK, um, so. I. It was a very large ship and I saw um, kind of in the. Blurry vision, shall we say? Um, it it's kind of seems like maybe it's maybe it's something they give you or what it is because things are not absolutely clear in the in the uh, distance of the of the ship that I was in, and I see three figures and they're kind of in the dark and they have big ho they have hoods on and they're huge they're big they're they're seven plus feet tall, and I immediately have a feeling in my in, in my heart like a, a remembrance of somebody a, a recollection and so I said I know you I know you and he and, and the one in the middle stepped forward and he dropped his cloak and his cloak he was a reptilian so that was the picture I was going to show you if I can so get back to it. Uh, before you get back to your uh, before you start mm -hmm. sharing it mm -hmm. how old are how old are you and how uh, old am I now? No, no. When, oh. when, when oh. you, when? I'm still 16. This is still uh, the same experience on board the big ship that took me. Okay, so is this a continuation of what you were, you were starting on a story, then you switched to a different story? Is this no, and I, it's the same e alien that just showed me. That was another time. So I switched to that story just to show you that they care about Earth. And the, and he said, is this the Earth you wish to live in? So it's the same ones there that have been with me throughout my whole life with that tall, willowy white one. And he was telling me, and so I just wanted you to know that the reason why I was in the hybrid program is that they don't think that they don't want us to destroy Earth. OK, so the hybrid program, in my opinion, that I ended up being in that this was my first gynecological examination was that was a very positive experience in my belief. OK, so. The uh, you started telling a story where the uh, was a craft above you and there was somebody bought something behind you. Yeah, that's where I am right now. I'm inside the ship. And I've already told you about how they, I was gynecological examination and I, and, uh, I, the willowy one leaned over and looked in my eyes and said, this is necessary for the hybrid program. And then repeating what I said about the three beings that were there in the dark. And the first one. How did, how did you get from being on the table where he's looking over you uh, to the part where you're I already told you I said the next thing I remembered from standing okay so it just jumped down. it just jumped it just, yeah there's there's a no there's no okay. it, that's All why right. regression, fine. that's fine I understand that's why, but that's why regression helps because it helps you understand what happens in between those blanked memories those right right I got flashes. it I got so it that's, okay so, so you went from hold on let me let me recontact you're on the uh ship on the table he leans over and tells you what he tells you and then the next moment you're looking at the three beings uh, three three aliens once steps forward takes off his cloak he's a reptilian so uh go from there okay so um so when he takes off his cloak this is what i see I don't know if can you see that? Not yet. Okay. The uh, screen went like it's going to share. Oh, there it is. Okay. So there he is. And this is what he looked like. And I will tell you that this being was with me. It's been, been off and on with me my whole life. And I'll go into him later, but I'll just finish this. Okay, go ahead. Experience. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. Okay, good. Yeah, I like seeing your facial expressions when you're talking. Okay. It helps people to, you know, people are always thinking, well, is this real? Is it not? Is she okay. telling the truth? Is she not? They, when they see how your, your expre facial expressions, they can, they can start believing your story because they realize, you know, people make strange 
facial expressions mm. when they're telling the truth and you're not making any of those so people can believe you if they can see your face mm -hmm. okay well you're not seeing me make them but i am <laughs> so <laughs> I, yeah. so now you can see me all right okay. so Go then ahead. um and really that's really the the last picture i really have to maybe one more picture i have i need to show uh so um when he steps forward i absolutely recognize him but i don't know why i recognize him i don't know why i have any kind of recognition with him and then i pass out because he's a reptilian he's scary looking so i pass out so um that was the end of that experience i have no more memory about that experience um i will tell you that um my whole family had a daylight encounter where we saw a ufo and um, now this was when I'm just going to go back a little in in, in age here when I, when I was like um, like 90 year, nine years old and uh, a ship came up alongside of us and my mother said for the love of Pete Roger what is that so we all looked out and we saw this ship and it was a saucer ship and it kind of was um, about the size as close wise it was about a hand, a hand as big as my hand so it was very close. Um, and it just was dry, flying with us right alongside of us as my father drove down the road. Top of the It was saucer. Saucer. And am I talking too fast? Maybe I am because I'm having no, to repeat you just need myself. To, well, uh, sometimes I miss things when you talk oh. really fast. So okay, well, I'll try to slow down. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Okay, because my story takes about a two and a half hours when anybody really does an interview. Yeah, hey, I've right? got two and a half hours. <laughs> Come on. I don't, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, and so we're looking at the saucer, and then find, all of a sudden it just shoo, disappears off into nothing. So we're continuing on our trip. This is a vacation, actually, with the family. And so we're on the trip, and we're, my father is driving us up this um, very, it was in um, Montana, and it um, and it's very, very curvy road, and we're uh, all in one by one, kind of start getting drowsy and falling asleep. And my sister, my older sister, said, "Don't worry, Dad, I'll stay awake with you." And then the next thing any of us remember is my dad screaming because <laughs> we're going up a mountain, right? And he's screaming. And screeching to a halt, and we're on the opposite side of the mountain, at the bottom of the mountain. Nobody knows how we got there. He's screeching to a halt. He said, "I don't know how how we got here. I don't. I have no idea." And so that was an never knew. It was just a missing period of time we never knew, except until I did the hypnosis on it and I found out what it was. And right. it, give us your hypnosis recall. Okay, so. Everything was like we remembered right at the time when all of us were being put to sleep, including my father. They picked up our entire car and put it over and and uh, and put it over on the other side. But but before they put it back, the car was must have been in the ship because I remember seeing my brother next to me on a table. That's really all I remember uh, about seeing um, my, my, a usual examination that I've had before where I could see um, on the top I could see it was almost like an x-ray but even deeper into my body not just the muscles and that such but deeper into my body and internal organs so they were doing this kind of a scan thing on me um, so that's really all um, you know I, I got about that and then when we were put back down, they put us back down and evidently turned on the engine and woke my woke my dad back up and he screamed and woke woke all us all of us up. So my father had also had an experience because he was a salesman on the road and he'd also had an experience uh, with seeing an ET come from the side of the road and come in front of him and stop and he went out. And that's the last thing he remembers. And then another time he was with my my sister was with him on the uh, on the sales trip and they both saw an, an alien that night. Did basically the same thing. Uh, just stand in front of their car and their car stops. 
So then what was interesting about um, this one was that um, the it had been snowing that night and he said when he got out of the car, <clears throat> it was all new fallen snow. There were no tracks behind him from his car and no tracks in front of him. So that was that. So it's been they followed family lines and uh, basically it's mostly been my dad uh, experience and then that family experience and then I've had quite a few experiences. Um, OK, so. Uh, if you moved forward from all the stories you've told so far and you wanted to cover um, all of your experience, uh, some other experience that happened to you. It doesn't have to necessarily be aliens. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be mind control. It could be my lab. It could be anything. And okay. the next things, next thing moving forward that comes to your mind that you think that you would like the, that you think it's important for the audience to hear, what, where would you go at this point? Well, I can't move forward because the I was living a, a parallel life almost. It was like part of it I was having ET experiences, and the other part was the MK Ultra. So I was born into an MK Ultra family. My father was also MK Ultra as a child himself. Well, then, uh, then go backward then. Okay, uh, okay. I just want to let you know it, it has yeah, to be that. You, okay. I don't care which way you go. Sideways is fine. Okay. Whatever, whatever works. Okay. So um, I was a family of 10 of us, and I was number nine. And the last one, the 10th one, died uh, of, of stillbirth. And there's a reason why I'm telling you that. Um, the strange things that happened with me and with my family throughout my growing up years um, have left me pretty much a loss. I had no memories of my childhood. Not, pretty much nothing. Um, the only way it, anything would come to me at all was if my family showed me a picture and said, and I was in it, and I'd go, oh, okay, but I don't remember it. So I had a lot of a lot of missing time, <clears throat> and the reason was. So hold on, before you give the reason. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so a lot of people don't remember much about the age when you saw the Bee Gees. And so, you know, I remember the vaguest things about four or five, uh, that range around four or five. My good memory starts around six to eight, and, mm -hmm. you know, and I get pretty good from six to eight. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, what... I what, don't what have memories your, what, at when all. When does your memory in general feel like it's like, like you've got a large amount of your uh, life that chunk where it starts about being 23 23 wow that's amazing okay yeah. go ahead and uh start anywhere you want uh and okay. okay so i've got to really just cut this down because it's a very long story so my <clears throat> both sides of my family had rosicrucian and mason on both sides uh third degrees uh <clears throat> 33rd degrees and such so that is one of the correlations that happen when you're having MK Ultra. <clears throat> Hang on. <clears throat> That's always happening when I talk about this. And um, so my family, like, like I was saying, I uh, had 10 children. Um, the It must have been going on for a long time, not just with me. I only am the memory. I, I don't remember. Um, I'm the only one not I'm not the only one I should say both my older siblings two of my older siblings went through MK Ultra and things like that as well uh, two of my living then they're not living now but two of them did not so with a group of out of 10 kids the first five four excuse me four kids died of all kinds of different things one lasted to be six. That was the first one. But then I believe that's when the MK Ultra came into it after that, because they died of weird things like carbon monoxide poisoning, um, uh, a, a hit to the back of the head, um, a tuber um, 
Um, so trying pause, to remember the pause in there for a second. Do you think your siblings were uh, executed because the uh, their controllers finally had no use for them, more use for them? I think either they were killed or taken and my parents were in mind control and had no idea what was going on. If this kind of thing would have happened and you would lose that many children uh, before the age of a year old, they would say like we had one that was a year old, we had one that was two years old, two that was two years old, and then the, the stillborn one. So um, four of them was in very weird circumstances. It's very, very weird. Um, and so I do believe, and and with my hypnosis session and my other healing work I've done, I, I definitely believe that they were taken from my mom and father. Um, my father, however, by the time I was one, two, three, throughout that time, as I have little flashes of memories, and of course regression, I brought some more information back, but that he was my, um, what we call my trauma-based mind control torturer. Not that I think he wanted to, but I believe he was also mind controlled. And so do you think the your siblings that were lost at an early age, do you think that possibly um, that maybe they were sacrificed? That could be. I had a terrible grandmother. She was as evil as she could possibly be. And I, uh, so it, it very well could be that she had something to do with them as well as what she did with me. Okay, so, go on. All right, so uh, now um, now we've moved and now I'm in uh, Blackfoot, Idaho. My grandma li grandmother lives on Asylum Lane, which is also the lane where the asylum, the psychiatric ward, but they called them asylum back there. So as a child, some of my programming was to be, uh, I would be taken, my dad would drive me supposedly out to my grandma's to spend time and give mom a break from her baby. Cause that was when I was like, um, it started at about three or four. And uh, I would go stay with grandma, I thought. Uh, but what would happen is I was either taken by grandma or by my father, I can't tell you which, to the asylum and in the, Basements of the asylum is where they did the MK Ultra um, trauma base biggest uh, things uh, um, like locked us into um, dark rooms and um, desensitization in boxes like the coffin kind of thing um, in psych uh, uh, <clears throat> um, electric shock. Type of things. So were you split into different personalities? Yes, I was. How many do you have? I have five base ones and a hundred or so. A hundred? Oh yeah, that's small amount for 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 MK uh, for their MK ultra. Because what happens? I'll explain it to you. So you have five base ones, and some of mine have names and some of them do not. But I've been working on this for the tune of about. 18 regressions now to try to find out about this. So, um, so when you have your root or base uh, altar that they make, because first they have to splinter your psyche and to these altars, and then they can start programming these altars. Now within these altars, you'll have like say a courier altar. And um, I, I, when I became older, I was sent out on curry or things. I might have been when I was younger, but I don't remember those. Um, and, but I'm just kind of giving you education a little bit on this. So the courier um, would be sent out, but let's say the courier ran into something that they'd have to fight. Well, they would have to have abilities to be able to fight, to be able to shoot guns, to use knives, to use um, uh, um, uh, psychic control, different things like that. So within that base altar, they're going to have all these 
threads of, of other altars, uh, all these, uh, I, I call them kind of floating altars. Uh, somebody gave me that name. It makes sense to me that they're not always used, but they're there if they need them for that altar. So um, that was, you know, have started happening through that time. Um, no need to really go through all of the different kinds of things of how they so do it. Your primary uh, function was as a courier? Or uh, no? What was your what what did they use you for more than anything else? Um, they use you as a courier, a beta slave, um, beta slave and sex slave. Um, there's um basically that's it courier beta slave uh, but they work together so let's say i'll give you an example of one of my experiences of course this is again i'm popping up to an adult thing so but i'm just going to tell you so i was flown across the the world to and i do still do not know what the name of the country was but i was picked up by a limo uh black limo and taken to this cobblestone area. I was dropped off. I was walked up to a door. I knocked on it. I said a four uh, word phrase, which I, I will not repeat because I could uh, uh, trigger somebody. So I four word phrase. The man who opened the door said a four word phrase back to me and I went in. I had a courier. So my courier was all in my mind. I had a photographic memory which is one of the important things that they do program in you. So I would give him the information. Well, this particular one, when I was able to find out, was he, I was telling him that this is the process that we're going to be taking over this country. We, which I'm going to say the dark shadow government of America, would be putting the president, taking the president that was currently there and putting their own choice into the president to take over and so it actually became a coup so we take parts in this well how they get the cur the information back and forth is our couriers so that nobody can hear their phone conversations or anything like that you see so that's a a, a fail safe way to do it so that's what i was used for a lot um let me see uh just trying to get back to kind of where I, I was. All right. So that so I have to go go back again now to my teenage life. So at 17 years old, go, go right ahead. I was going go. I was I was uh, going to the little um, open college day before you actually go to college. I wanted to go to college more than anything. Um, I but I had not been a very good student, so I was I guess I was just desperately trying to figure out a way that I could go to college. And so I was there at the college and this man walked up to us. Uh, there was three of us. The man walked up to us and said, hey, anybody want to make a few hundred dollars um, helping with college? And um, he said, um, all you have to do is be in a, a dream study and we're going to be mapping your dreams and, and watching what you do in your dreams. And I thought, wow. It was like four or five hundred dollars in 1967. That was that was a lot of money. So um, I did go the following day to a brownstone building just off the campus and walked in the door. There were people in long lab coats. And they put me on a bed and hooked me up. And that was the last thing I remembered until. Uh, I might have the month wrong here, but say it was eight months later. So eight months later, I think it's like uh, August or something like that. I, I wake up. So that's a lot. That's the last thing I remember. I wake up and I am looking at this ticket that says my last name, but not my first name. I mean, excuse me, my first name, but not my last name. And it was like really perplexing. And I was in Seattle and I went, how in the world did I get in Seattle from Black, uh, from Pocatello, Boc Idaho? And so through that long trip back to through a bus station, I remembered and had flashes, just little flashes of what happened. So supposedly um, 
I uh, was part of a group that was in a bus. There were some young boys, 12, 13 years old, and some young women like me, uh, 17, 18, 19. And we were in a bus and we were going through this uh, big gate. That's why I have a gate on the, my picture of my book. This big gate and uh, we we're driving through the gate and then that stops and another mind control uh, put in memory that they installed in me says, oh, you were cleaning houses. And so then I think, oh, cleaning houses. I don't remember cleaning houses. And then it comes back. The image comes back of the gate and the house, and it's a big old mansion-looking house, and it has lights in the, all over, and there's cars. So I know it's not. So it looks like it's a party. So we're taking. So I keep into that memory, and I go back, and we're taken out of the bus. We're putting up. We walked up a back area stairs, um, and put in the boys in one level below uh, above us, and us in this next level. We're put in. We're told to wear. Uh, fancy gowns and we're supposed to be sent down to talk with all of the people at the party. Now, the party had how Hollywood. Old, how old are you again? At this 17. Time? 17. Okay. Go ahead. Well, actually, I had turned 18 during that missing time. So, okay. Yeah. 18. Right. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we are, uh, we're, there's dignitaries, uh, foreign dignitaries, there's like presidents, there's like like I, there's people like are from uh, um, Persia and places like that. There's, like I said, Hollywood. There's a couple of politicians that one just recently died and another one's still alive that were there. Um, and there um, are, are all kinds of other people there. And so we, as the um, what we call party favors, are uh, there to entertain the guests and if you've ever seen the show eyes wide shut that's a pretty close i, I have not heard i have not seen it but i've heard rumors about it so. yeah totally it it is it it uh, they wore masks and stuff uh at the ceremonies now before um they were like just normal people but then after the biggest part of the party. Then when we went into this other area, that's where the whole thing with the mask and stuff comes comes together. So you knew who was really at the party if you were somebody who was watching everything. But once you got in, you didn't know who were the people who participated in the rituals. So you didn't know if if they who they were. So they, they all had masks on and there was there was rituals. And that's where I saw another kind of uh, reptilian. Now, we were from uh, that. Stop for a second. Okay. Before you get into the reptilian and the rituals, hold that train of thought. Okay. okay. Uh, are these satanic rituals or are these, what kind of rituals are they? These are satanic rituals. Okay. Now keep going. Go, go, okay. uh, go ahead with your story. Okay. And as you know, I have a, a TV um, interview here. So um, oh, uh, I've just got to check my email. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Take your time. They just sent me a message, so I got to see what's going on here. Take your time. You have important business. Okay, there it is. All right. Uh, okay. Still no news on what time they're supposed to contact me. Let me know. Okay. So. You can keep checking every hour if you want, or every 30 minutes, or however often you okay, want. Okay, I've just got to turn on my phone so that I don't miss their message. Oh, yeah, keep I, your phone on, yeah. Okay, I always turn it off during interviews, but no, that's I, okay. I'll turn it. Okay. It's, it's fine. Okay, all right. So I apologize. Um, no, no reason to apologize. All right, so... Um, so then after that ritual, which is really creepy anyway, it has like a this very methodical guy who wears a, a a different color cape than everybody else has on i think it's like purple deep 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 purple maroon, maroon color and then the guests wear seem to be wearing more like brown ones um and so after that ceremony we're taken now down which happens to be 
oh, I should tell you that before all of that happens, we're we're entertaining the guests and some of the guests are going up and being entertained by the boys. So we're the party favors, sexual party favors for that. So that happens first. So that's always happens at these parties. Um, and of course, drugs and all of those things as well. OK, so now that part of it's over. Now we go down into a deep, deep cavern. Again, I can't tell you because I was. Didn't have evidently it was due to drugs. I couldn't remember how I got down there stairs or whatever. I don't know. I just know the next memory I have. We're in what it looks like a cave and there's these people with brown robes on. Now it's not near as many people as was in the party and the one upstairs. So it's more like about 10 or something like that. People in brown robes um, and there's a ledge up above us where two people are standing and the people are one man has a, a uniform on with a lot of brass. I couldn't tell you if who he was or if it was even an American. It, I just know it was a uniform and it was a dark green uniform. Um, and then the next to him is a draconian. Now it's not like the same reptilian Ayano which is that Ayana one that I saw on the ship earlier I told you about. This one's different. He's much bigger, much stockier, and he's a darker, darker green, almost green brown. And so he's up there. So they're overseeing everything. So then this ritual happens. And within that ritual, at least one of the, from each group of the young women and the boys were sacrificed that night. So, so yes. how many how many people do you think were sacrificed that night? I there's no way for you to know. I don't know. I don't know because I was only turned on when I was when I woke up. I only saw what when I woke up because I could have been standing there for 30 minutes. I don't know. I just remember waking up standing there in white. We were in white uh, kind of gown looking things and uh, then they were re disrobed as they were disrobed and they were put on that that uh, slate rock thing and then sacrifice. So now um, so that's that's. Gets you back to now we're back on the bus, OK, so oh, hold on before you okay. before you go on the bus, okay. uh, keep that train of thought. Um, let's back up just for a second. So um, we all know that MK Ultra was done by CIA. We also know that your rituals were satanic. Yes. So uh, MK Ultra was supposedly about mind control. And I never heard any tie-in with satanic in it. I'm not saying there isn't. I'm just saying I'm not familiar with that side of it, if it exists. So I'm curious as to know if, if have you ever recovered any understanding of whether what's at the top, whether it's the aliens, the CIA, the Satanists, mm -hmm. uh, or who's who's running the show of all your, it, you know, MKUltra is just a name for mind control, but it doesn't, I, I have a feeling Mind control goes way beyond MK Ultra. Mm -hmm. Just, just, just my intuition tells me that. But so, who do you think was in charge of all the things you witnessed? And um, and was it say you know uh, dark forces that are beyond the physical, or the CIA, or the people that were into satanic rituals who think you know that Satan is running the show or, you know, just mm -hmm. uh, just who do you think is it or the aliens or who do you think is running uh, that overall um, thing that you went through for so many years? Who do you think was at the top of all of that and why and what was their um, sort of motivation sort of thing? OK, so Later on, the story will kind of be revealed more, but I'll just tell you, in my opinion, that from what I think, feel, know, I've learned now, is that uh, the satanic part is just one of the parts 
to um, to terrify people. It's all about fear. It's all about fear. And because not only that one draconian, but in other rituals I've been exper I've ex been in, ex part of, not part of, but been in, um, there were reptilians basically hovering over the people as they died, which I know they were taking their adrenaline, their energy out, their adrenochrome. Of course, now the the there's that adrenochrome that's happening with the children that they finally have released. So, so you're saying that they were feeding off of the fear energy. Yes, before the Lush, before the Lush. The Lush, before the person mm -hmm. died. Exactly. Okay. As the person is dying, as the person is dying, they were feeding off the loosh, and it would. And when it did, you could see they uh, they absolutely became much because they weren't very animated before that. As soon as they got that, they had these these dracon uh, draconians that were lined up, kind of like for everyone who was sacrificed, they were like ready for their hit, and they they became more animated, and you know they you could tell they were like probably high. It's a, it's a drug to them. It's from it's a high for them. So I do believe that this is the level it goes. I do believe that the draconians, and then we have the draconian shapeshifters, and then we have the the the, the shapeshifters that are now running the world. Uh, the uh, every part of it, in my opinion, um, um, as as the the above. So then these shapeshifters who are in offices and are in presidential offices they're all different uh, all over the world they are and then of course you've got your bankers and you've got all of that uh you've got the you know the the, uh, the uh, illuminati and everything so to me those are shape-shifting draconians in my opinion and they are running it and then the cia are their minions Minions, really. They're their dirty so, work. I've got, I've got a question uh, based on my own experience because I've seen uh, beings that I, they looked sort of human, but I could tell they were shapeshifters, but I don't think they were reptilians because the, oh. the shapeshift, the, the um, how do I put this, the teeth that they, the image they portrayed was like a human with very, very odd teeth. Mm. But the teeth were not the teeth that a reptilian would have. They're teeth that exist only for to create fear. It mm. wasn't teeth that are functional. They weren't, uh -huh. you know, if you, regardless of what type of being it is, you'd have functional symmetric teeth. Mm -hmm. the teeth I'm talking about would be like, like at an angle and not mm -hmm. functional at all mm -hmm. but they're just created they're just there to sh to make you f afraid to mm -hmm. give you an image that would that would put you in a state of fear they're not mm -hmm. they're not it's not like the reptilian you're seeing it's shape-shifting from a human into reptilian this is a what looks like a human that's giving you an image that is partially human but got weird teeth that are not mm -hmm. functional in any way, shape, or form, just right. to be afraid. What, if you saw something like that, what do you think that would be? There's no name for them, but yes, there are. Sh uh, there's many ra races that are shapeshifters. There are many, not just the draconians and the reptilians have the ability because uh, there's other races. Now, see, there's so many different types of reptilians. So your Draco reptilian is one. And then you have reptoid reptilian, which are the ones that supposedly were on this planet during the dinosaurs. You've got the raptor ones also part of that. So they could be all shapeshifters, um, but I do believe there's other races that are shapeshifters as well. But, uh, okay, so let me let me take a step back. Um, oh, uh going into the so we have the cia is the uh pretty much the low man i believe on the totem pole of all of this hierarchy of who is controlling our planet and because they the draconians have been here since 
and they were the Anunnaki's part of the Anunnaki. So it's kind of a, a confusing thing about that, but I think part of the Anunnaki's Anunnaki just means those that came from the stars. So part of the Anunnaki's were the negatives, the draconians, and part of them, I believe, were maybe uh, uh, an extraterrestrial race. So, so, so before you get into all that. Okay, I know where you're going, but um, do you know anything about um, um, the beings that were on the Earth before humans got here? Well, the beings were on the Earth before humans got here. Yeah, okay, so... Let okay, me, let, me, let me be explicit. My, the reptilians told me it was that they were the ones that were there with the dinosaurs. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you ha you might want to ask yourself, who was here before the reptilians got here? Oh, I believe uh, the cedars were here before. Cedars as in trees? What? Cedars as in trees? Um. The 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 ones who seeded this planet, the galactics who seeded this planet, everything from yeah. plants, animals, and and who would that be, the cedars? Um, they would be sent from God source, I believe, but they would be they could be extraterrestrial galactics, not okay. extraterrestrial, more galactics. Okay, so uh, my understanding of of history goes as follows. Mm -hmm. um, the current race before, or the current civilization, before that, uh, Atlantis, before that, Lemuria, before, that's like three. So then before that, uh, we, this is my own research. It's not something you're gonna find anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, we were shape-shifting uh, dragons. Oh okay. yeah, dragons, yeah. We were dragons, I, I, I've been the dragon. So you remember that? Uh, and my regressions that think has come out, absolutely. Okay, well, that's that's pretty nice that you're the first person I've talked to that that remembers being a dragon, except except the guy who told me, oh. and one other person that he was with that I knew. Uh, they, he, I've never interviewed the guy on video. It's too bad, but I have mentioned the story about how we were shape-shifting dragons and how that played out. And I won't go into it here because I'm here to listen to your story. But mm -hmm. we, you know, when the guy first told me the story, I, I thought it was all BS. And then he, he started, one of the things he said was he didn't want to be associated with the story. So he didn't want publicity. He didn't want money. He was not going to ever get anything from telling me this story because he wasn't going public. He wasn't talking. Mm -hmm. he, do, he does not want me to mention his name or what he does mm -hmm. or associate him in any way. So there was nothing for him to gain. Mm -hmm. And then and then I just started listening to him talk uh, and tell the story out. And he did not give any inflections like he was making something up. Mm -hmm. So the longer he talked, the more I believed what he said. And you can go listen to my interviews if you want to hear all that stuff. Anyway, mm -hmm. you go ahead with where you were, and we'll just continue. I have a question for you. Uh, okay, Shape-shifting sh shape dragons, what did the shape-shifting dragons look like? Or were they what we think of as the big dragons? Or is this something else? So. No, yeah, that's correct. We okay. flew around the sky. Right, right. And we were greenish and huge. And I'm not sure about the fire part. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure either. But uh, we would shape-shift from dragon into human and then back and forth oh. and the women stayed in human form more than the men did the men tended to stay more in dragon form but the aliens came along uh, have you ever seen the um have you ever seen the the statues of dragons in remote areas of or in any areas of china they're not out they're not they're nowhere oh, else but in China. Yeah, I, I've seen the, the, some of the statues and pictures. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in the statues I've seen, do you know what the dragons have in their paw? No. They have a ball. And the Chinese believe the ball is the earth. The Chinese are wrong. Mm -hmm. It's not the earth. What they're, the dragon is holding in his paw 
is a is a spaceship that's in the shape of a ball, mm-hmm. and it has a um, a um, a light going around the edge, around the center, and the the dragons would catch the alien spaceships in their paw and crush them and kill the aliens. And but when the when humans were in human form, they the aliens would catch them in a, a magnetic uh, force field, some type of force field, and take them into their craft and then strip us of our ability to shapeshift. And <laughs> and they basically by doing that to all the all of us that were on the earth at the time, uh, they basically got rid of us as shapeshifters. And so that's yeah, that's uh, the story told and and I would not that's have believed new. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't listened to him slowly tell the whole story with all the details. He went to China, um, a remote part of China, and and got into this. And you know, I don't want to get into too much detail because it'll just take up too much time. Mm-hmm. But you can go listen to my one of my interviews and get into that if you want. I will check it out because I'd never heard about shape shifting humans before. I just remember being a very mm, thirty foot tall. Uh, dragon and then another time having communication and speaking inter- uh, interfacing with the dragon telepathically with in another lifetime so yeah well, so i've had some interaction with dragons one of the uh one of the people i've interviewed uh, uh god what is her name uh, i can't remember her name off the top of my head lesson is her name uh, oh janet lesson she's a dear friend of mine janet lesson okay well uh she uh, was taken to uh, speak with a dragon that is supposedly still on the earth today, mm-hmm. the last of them. Mm-hmm. That uh, she doesn't mention it shape shifting, but she does mention that there are dragons still on the earth today. Mm-hmm. And I think this was in the middle of the ocean underneath yep. Uh, yep. A, a, a military base yep. island. Yep, it sure was. Yeah, and she, and she talks about the, um, uh, 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 what's it called? Uh, a movie that depicts a little bit of what her experience was in meeting that dragon. I can't remember what the movie is now. Journey? No, no. What's it called? Uh, I don't know. Saturn? No. Jupiter. Jupiter Ascending. Uh, yeah, that is yeah. an ex- excellent movie. I've seen it yeah. at least twice. And she okay. said that place where they take her into the big palace and stuff to meet uh, that she said very things like that. Oh, you mean to her. The, the dragon that's the, the, the creature that's working for uh, the relative that uh, wants to take away the earth from her. Yes, or yes, just, yes, 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 yes. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's an excellent yeah. movie. It's worth yeah, watching. It is. It is a lot of thought in that. It, that lots, lot, and I think she feels that they may have stole some of her experience that she shared at conferences, which was that one. So that's pretty interesting. Oh. Okay. Well. Okay. I don't think the dragon, the the creature in that movie, is the same as what I'm talking about. But uh, it may be what she was taken to to, to talk to. And uh, because, no, no, it was a dragon dragon, but she said the procession, how they put her in a fancy clothes and stuff like that. She was presented to the dragon in this very, you know, fancy costume and um, dress and stuff like that. So that's just what she remembers. Being a dear friend, she may not have um, shared that with you, that particular one. But dear friend, we've talked for hours. So, you know, I'm actually, she did. But uh, oh. But it's just, I'm just saying that creature didn't have wings and wasn't a f- flying dragon like I'm talking about. Oh, I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, it's something, it's something I'm going to definitely look. I'll tell Yeah, you know, at one time on this earth, there was huge, our mountains or trees. So, you know, why not? Why couldn't there have been dragons at that time? Okay. So go back, go ahead with your story. 
where okay. we do where at. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So. So I think I I finished the whole thing about my opinion of who's running the earth. So sure. I, I, okay. Sure. All right. So what I'd like to do is um, go back to help you understand why um, I am able to understand draconians and the way they think and and everything because I interface with not only draconians and other reptilians and even aliens. But um, as a child, I was taken on board ships and with other kids and we would be taught different things. And what I remember my group of kids being taught is there was holograms all around the ship uh, in the room we were in, I should say, the holograms. And these holograms had uh, what you could call uh, um, symbols, hieroglyphics, things like that. So it's alien languages. So we were to learn those. There was also talk, a speaking galactic language that was heard. And so I, from that, started learning galactic interface and galactic language. So, so I, in my experiences, I will hear what they're telling me and I can talk to them telepathy and talk and communicate. So this is one of the reasons um, that you'll hear later in my story why I was taken into the my lab abduction program as well. That's military re laboratory abduction and military reabduction because I was an interfacer with extra thresholds and that was something that they 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 want to use us that they're interfacers and psychic but I went about with aliens. So I just wanted to tell you about my childhood connection to that. And then throughout my life, I have um, I would like to also tell you throughout my life, all the way up until, well, the first time was when I was 18 years old. I had my first, shall we say, a hybrid genetics. I was with a friend and we, uh, so the first time I was inseminated in this abduction. So I'll explain this abduction briefly. So we were out. We were looking for ships and we were sitting on the top of this mountain. And this is in Idaho and and Lava Hot Springs, actually. And uh, we saw this UFO or and it was just in a distant light, but it was not moving like anything else. And so I started flashing with my headlights to get it to react to us. And it certainly did react. It came closer. And as it came closer, a light shined right down on the front of my hood and uh, and the gal and I both looked at you and said, oh, my God, we got to get out of here. The next thing I, I know, next memory I have uh, and, and well, I'm sorry, I apologize. There, there was first we we got out of the car. We were already out of the car looking at, at it. And that's when I, uh, it came too close and flashed the beam. And that's when we said, we've got to get out of here. So we was getting get. get trying to get back in the car and the next thing we know is nothing blank and then the next thing i <clears throat> i know is i have the my willowy one and the others around and i have genetics something genetically happening and then um we get the next thing i know we're back in the car well, hold on I, for a second so when you say something genetically happening can you be a little more specific I, I guess I was inseminated. Okay, go ahead. That, that, yeah, it's inseminated. So, <clears throat> and then the next memory we have is we're sitting, I'm sitting behind the driver's seat and she's there and we have no memory what happened. We just look at each other and said, oh, okay, well, we had, because all we remember is the sighting. Oh, that was such a cool sighting. It was close. Let's go down and tell our friends about it. So we're driving back and as we see what time it is, we lost uh, three hours, actually two hours, and then it took us about an hour to get back home. So we lost two hours. So I found out, <clears throat> not found out, I found out what had happened. <laughs> um, six weeks, five, five or six weeks later, I'm, I'm having a miscarriage. I'm having horrendous, um, I'm having a hemorrhaging is how I first found out. I'm hemorrhaging all of a sudden. And so, um, my sister takes me uh, to the hospital and the doctor says, where's the baby? Where's the baby? And I said, what do you mean baby? I mean, 
first of all, you have to have sex to have a baby. There had not been any of that. So we're, it's a you spontaneously uh, abort here. And so where's the fetus? And I said, I didn't even know I was pregnant. And he's, well, you did. You must have lost it somehow or other. So uh, I got to do a DNC. So at that time, I was impregnated. So I knew what had happened. So, so uh, stop for a second. So you're talking about a conversation with a doctor. Yeah. Okay. Why did you go to the doctor? Hemorrhaging. Okay. When, Hemorrhaging. when you hemorrhage, you go to a doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I got Not it. a doctor, a hospital. A hospital. hospital. So I you went, hemorrhaged, you went to the hospital, and you found out that you I lost, pregnant. you I had lost baby. some something that was there. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, go on. Okay, so then I have an experience, which seemed like a dream, where I'm taken up in a ship, <clears throat> and I'm taken to the nursery, and I, I, I don't know it's a nursery at this time. I just know it's kind of a dark area. It's a little darker than any place I've ever been. And this, what I feel definitely was a female, walks up to me with a baby. And she puts it in my hand, and it is the size of my hand cupped together. It is so tiny and so scrawny. And so, you know, it's like a little leg is leaning, pulling over my leg, uh, over my uh, side of my hand here. And, and it just uh, is so tiny. And But I immediately bonded with it. And so the... Remember, I am able to see and hear what they say. So, and they do a lot of telepathic messages within visual. So they said, this is a success. And then she shows me this imagery <clears throat> of other people being handed babies and the things that they did. Like, uh, like a couple of women like backed off and said, I don't want anything to do with it, it's hideous, or, or they cried. Uh, this one guy dropped the baby and they just was showing me some disasters of when this presentation happened with other people. And they said to me, you know, they said, this is success. And they said that uh, telepathically, you know, you bonded. And so this will be a hybrid program. So I will be part of the hybrid program. This is important. So um, then that's when a many, many hybridization things happen. So you're... What? How old are you uh, during this event? Uh, that event, I am uh, 18. Okay, and who is it that's telling you all this? Uh, a, a white, will, a white gray. I mean, a white one that looks like my willowy one. Only it's a female. And it's tall. And it's it's tall. Yeah, it's not a little it gray. Taller than you. No, I'm about the same size, it's maybe a, just a slight, slight bit more. So, but, but yeah, it's probably not. It's not six foot. It's probably you, you five never got eight. A, you got a never, never got a name from her. No. Okay, well, go on. She's, she you. was all business. She was all business. This was the baby stuff, and this was important, and there was no real communications with no me. Other than, so, yeah, well, other on. than that one image and tell me. And then I was also. Um, brought up several other times to be introduced to my children. And um, the next one was a baby, a, not a baby, a little girl about three years old. Of course, these are years later, right? Okay, so throughout my hybridization thing, this has been going on throughout my life until uh, the last hybrid I was shown was, uh, well, I'll show you. so I'm not gonna go into all the different ones. Okay, I'm gonna get go into a very interesting one where I was taken into the hybrid area, <clears throat> the nursery, and there were all kinds of kids there, like probably 15, 16, 17 kids. They aged, ranged from little tots, little little toddlers to teenagers. Now the teenagers looked very, very, very skinny and kind of really gaunt. They didn't look, and, and they were all humanoid looking, but, um, well, not, but different colors even. They had different colors, but they were humanoid with different extraterrestrial features. Some had different eye looks, some had dark eyes. None had big black eyes. Uh, they all had pupils of some type, and um, but they were in di some different colors and tones. And then the older ones, I, I mean, were very skinny. So anyway, I, I, said, I said, oh, well, which one is mine? And they said, 
they all are. <laughs> that was two beings there that time. That was Willowy one and, and the and the nurse nursery lady. And she uh, said they uh, all uh, all sixteen. How many, how, many, how many kids were there? 16, 17, something like that. Okay, so have you ever through all of your regressions that you've had, have you ever asked the question, how many offspring have you bore total? No, I haven't. Okay, go on with your story. Something we could do. <laughs> sure. Uh, okay. Go on with your story. Uh, okay, so, um, and then another time after, okay, so now we're at the time where I started having the my lab experiences being taken by the my lab abductions, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, at the same time I started having these my lab abductions, I'd be taken by a grays out of my home. I'd be taken by reptilians, or I would call them reptoids, out of my home. And I'd be taken to deep underground military bases. And it would have anything from uh, um, accu what's not, not accusation, um, interrogations, uh, just questioning first, you know, and then it would actually go into interrogations some of the times to what ship were you on? Who were the aliens? What did they teach you? Uh, all these kinds of things. They wanted to know everything I about my experience. Uh, they also wanted to know my psychic abilities, what my abilities. So they test me with those and test and test. So that was the my lab experiences. Um, there was many of them and they went on for from 89 to 2000 to 2000 um okay another important part of that is so, I'll stop for a second so okay. okay so you were taken by grays at some point and reptilians at other points mm -hmm. and um and gather and military at other points and the myla the the humans came behind the, all that to see what was happening. No, the myla. No, no, no. I would have ET experiences. I'd have ET experiences with either my Palladians because I've had experience with Palladians, and my other galactic and and uh, and my Willowy one and the hybrid program. But I would also be. After they either bring me back uh, at ha an hour, sometimes even a day after, I'd get reabducted by the government, which would be, in my opinion, would either be the Greys would take me, the reptilians would take me, or the humans in un in um, uniform would take me, and then they take me back to the underground base, and uh, I'd have different experiences there. They were all working together. In many different levels, because I learned about that, uh, I'll give you an example, if I may, about that. So one particular time, I was abducted by reptilian, and then so on. I remember them being first. They showed up on my weird thing. They showed up on my screen, like a image through on my screen, and then I was out, gone. I wake up to walking down this corridor, uh, this hallway, and on this side is black slick rock wall, and it's all slicked up and black. And on this side, there's little cubicles, and with with a, like a probably a two way glass right there in front. And um, and so there are people in those, and and so I'm walking down, and I know because of a smell and because I know and can sense when they're around, there's a a reptilian next to me. Now, this is what I consider a reptoid. Uh, so this reptoid is walking next to me, and he's very tall, much taller than me. And I know that because the people who are walking towards me are looking straight at me, and they don't look at him. They don't look at him. They just look at me up and down, but they never look at him. And so I said to him, telepathically, why are they looking at me? I know you're there. Why don't they look at you? And he sends me back this imagery of a, just two imageries of, of a, a military guy being like hauled away like he's being arrested by some MPs. And another one where this military guy who's definitely looked at him in his eyes has gone crazy. He's been he's insane now. He's like screaming like a madman. And it, and he says to me, they must honor us. 
we are in charge of this level and they are not allowed to gaze on us and look at us and and the whole story tells why because if they if human looks at them they can make them go nuts and in there it's against the rules too for them so okay stop go on question stop, stop for a second mm -hmm. okay so um we know the the hierarchy from reptilians to humans you just told us that mm -hmm. so is there a hierarchy among the aliens themselves between the greys and the reptilians and that you've you've you have you ever come across anything like that and if so I, I I can't say that. I only remember on the different levels, the gray, this particular kind of gray uh, is in charge. And this level that I had in, when my son and I was abducted together, that's another kind of gray that was in charge. And then the draconians are in the lower level and they are in charge. So I do believe the grays are over excuse me the reptilians are definitely over the grays and the, but that's only because um i just b believe it i mean i i'm i'm trying to think if i've got any experiences that grays and reptilians were over together well the reptilians on board the ship but um you know that i talked about earlier i i think it's just what i think I don't know for sure. So you just believe that, but you're not sure. I just, I'm not sure. I just believe that. Okay, go on with your story. Okay, so the uh, another experience where I'm taken by, um, uh, at this time I'm not sure if it was reptilians or it was greys that took me out of my, uh, into the, my out of my body or into the physical. I'm not sure. It's hard to tell for sure, <laughs> but I do believe that my lab had to be physical. So that's why I do remember the grays. So I think it was a gray for sure, not a reptilian thing. So I'm in a, a bed, uh, not a bed, on a table. And I wake up and there's a reptilian standing at the door. And he's just like, just kind of looking, not looking at me, just looking straight ahead. And I said to him, why are you invading our planet? What did we do to you? And he sends me back this imagery and this message. We are not the invaders, you are. And then he shows me this image about all kinds of um, um, dinosaurs and all different types of dinosaurs and, and pterodactyls and all kinds of different um, uh, prehistorics. And they're all running, running, running. And they're running from all these comets coming down. And then he shows me that the comets are being directed by a large, by ships above that are using these comets as weapons. And he said, um, that we were here long before you. And showing me that imagery, <clears throat> I understand. And then he says, and those of us who were smarter and smaller, or not smarter, intelligent, more of us, more intelligent, went in the, uh, in the underground and have evolved before you see before you, is what he said to me. So I do believe that some of the reptoids now in the deep, underground bases feel that they really are here before the humans because they were here during the dinosaurs. So. Um, I did interview, I've interviewed, uh, let's see. I interviewed a MUFON uh, director of one of the states. I think it was Southern California, one of the uh, directors of Southern California. And he, he said his mother was uh, worked for Howard Hughes in a deep underground military base in the middle of a desert. He never, he was never told, he told, she told him about that, you know, those things, but she never mentioned which desert it was. So it could mm -hmm. be literally any, the middle of any desert on earth. So I'll just give you that piece of information and let you go on with your stories. Well, where I was when these reptilian experiences were happening and being taken to the base was, I know it was Area 51 or some part of S4, some part of S4. <clears throat> Since Creech Air Force Base has the tall whites uh, that are live out there and under in the, in the, in the inner uh, layer levels there, then I think definitely I know it was Area 51 that I was taken to. Um, and I'll so, tell you. So how, how do you know it was Area 51? 
well, this is how come I feel 100% it was. All right, so I my I uh, wake up one night and I'm in an elevator. So I go to bed and I wake up one night, I'm in an elevator and there's other people around here. And these people are, so it's probably the wee hours of money, right? Some of these people are dressed in uh, like, uh, like clothes, like they're out for the evening. Others are in pajamas. And I can't think of another 24 hour town that has a, a, a base base. So that's why I think it was definitely Area 51 because these people that were around me, they were also in this straight zombie state that could only, I could only move my eyes. And I was looking at the the two, three people that were up, up front of me. The, and then I had, an, uh, like I said, I had a woman in pajamas here. I had a guy who like was dressed up to go out it was definitely not in bed and jammers. I never had another guy with his shirt off. So I don't know what exactly what he had on below. Uh, and um, and then when the elevator and in front of on the at the elevator, there was a man in a uniform and it was in a, a black uniform. It was uh, it, he had a gun in, that he was doing. It was like a parade rest there just standing there. But his eyes, nobody was home. His eyes were like he was stoned and he was just looking straight forward and the elevator stopped and it's like his brain just clicked on and then he started moving and and he started uh, uh, oh, the door open and he started going out and evidently there were other soldiers behind because they started pushing this large group of people. This was a large elevator and I will tell you that I could hear people crying. I could hear people go acting like they were talking in their sleep and mumbling and things like that. So it's definitely, there was is a, a really a variety of groups. So anyway, so then we're pushed out of the elevator and there we're separated into two groups. So I could only see through my eyes, uh, looking just through this side of my eyes, but I saw the group going over this way and I saw what they were going to and it was these but grays, but they were beige grays. They weren't, and they were taller than any kind of little gray. So these were a different species altogether. They were a beige gray, and they smelled like rotten garbage, rotten fruit garbage. It was awful. Um, and so in that group with my 14 year old son, I saw him. He was being taken to those aliens. On the other group uh, it was military and military, and then lab coat people and humans. And uh, my group was being taken that way. So that's why I do believe. And then another experience we had where we woke up. Hold on, hold on before you go to the second experience. Okay. How old were you in the last experience? Oh, I started? was an adult. That was just, that was just, uh, okay, my son was 14 and he's now 40. So, um, um, okay. I had him in 77. And it was it's a brain 70. teaser, isn't it? Yeah, it is. In my 50s. Okay. Okay. Uh, go right ahead with your story. Okay. So in my 50s, maybe no, no, not my 50s. Uh, okay, 84, 89. Okay, I was 40. Oh, I, was that's a, a, I was in my early 40s, actually. That's a, that's uh, a big okay. difference. Okay. Yeah, that's a big uh, difference. Uh, right. Go on with your next story. Yeah. So, so then. Um, how I know this happened is uh, the next morning I wake up in bed and I go and uh, I remember this dream. This is just way too real for to be a dream. So I say to the boys, hey, how did everybody sleep last night? And and my one son said, oh, good, real good. And the other one said, I had a horrible nightmare, mom, because we talked about all of their ET experiences. They've had they had an ET experiences their whole life, even though they won't come out about it in, in public. Uh, just mom and uh, and. I'm going to call him E. And so he says uh, he said I had a horrible dream that I was in a, a cave or and a gra underground in a cave and there were these ugly. Grays. These ugly aliens, he didn't call it crazy, these ugly aliens that were there and they experimented on me. So I knew he had, had the same experience with me. So I knew it was right. It wasn't just a dream. And then another time, because we did, did I did this checking up all the time with the kids to find out. Um, I woke up and Eric was the one, oops, 
oh well, whatever. He's the one that told me about this in the first place. He said, Mom, I had a dream, and, and I remembered I had the same dream. Mom had a dream that um I was in a van, like like a like a big track van like my my dad drives, because his dad was a tractor trailer driver. And he said, and I was in the back of it with uh, some other people, and you were there. And and that was the experience when I had the memory of being on at the table and asking that alien, um, you know, why are you invading us? So I knew he was there at that experience too. So I knew it had to be here. I'm looking at where the experiences happened. It had to be somewhere out here. If it wasn't Area 51, it was S4 somewhere in S4. That's almost a thousand miles, dude. You know, it goes into California, into Utah, and into Arizona. How, how big is it? Oh, it's it's almost it's a it may be over a thousand it may be almost a thousand or or a thousand miles big. You're talking about the size of the base. The underground. Oh, the underground. See the, the underground the surface isn't that big. No, no, no. The surface does go all the way to Tonopah and all the way into Salt Lake, but uh, uh not Salt Lake, excuse me, Utah, but the. Uh, and you know, and and into California. That's the different bases that are there that are part of this deep underground network. So you're saying under underneath Area 51, you think it's like thousands of miles uh, open? I do, or and at least, far? or at least connected by the rails. You know, they have the big train trams and stuff like that. Um, which I do not remember ever being on one. I, I don't have any dream, any dream or, or any regression that it's come up. So I don't know. Uh, but um, but there's so there. How, there how do you think uh, the part that's underground of Area 51? How deep do you think that is? I, I can only say seven or eight levels. Oh, you don't know. You don't know what how what what elevation they're on. No, I really don't. Okay, well, go on with your story. Okay. Uh, all right, so that kind of see if anything else. that kind of takes me in to the rest of the my lab experience, except for the final one. Um, I was praying to my Octurians that I also connected with Octurians, and they actually uh, I was told by my guides that they were going to be coming in to protect me and protect my home and my children because I said, I can't keep having this happen. This is horrible. They're taking my son. I don't know what the, I don't know how to stop it. And so um, that's when Ayano came back. So Ayano was the reptilian and the big around the saucer when I was um, 16 that I saw. I had not seen him until this time. So in about 1992, in about 1992, um, I, I, like I said, I, I, I'm praying and trying to get some protection here. And in 1992, a beautiful energy starts showing up in my experiences. And I'm taking on, taking out some some very little, very little memories. One, one memory is I remember being on board a ship and I didn't see anybody, but I was aware somebody was there. So, but I didn't, but that was the only time. And so then another time I remember being on the board ship and seeing humans, okay? And they were just like, they were, I was like maybe some place where there was doing some um, work with, with dials and whatever, not dials, but with things and stuff. So I remember seeing them. And then, um, so, so then, okay, so then we're back with my, my being who's all, colorful and stuff. Oh, I, I forgot to tell you. I have one dream where it's a human coming to me and he is this handsome human and it has some kind of a not not not, not really physical, but he's floating over me. And he's human looking. Okay. But he's floating over me on the bed and he's human. Okay. So then now one night I see this energy come in and I remember that I feel that other guy floating over my bed is the same energy that this is. And so I ask him, you're not this energy. You look different. I know you do. Please show me who you are. And he said, and he telepathically says to me, are you sure you're ready? And I said, yes, I know I'm ready. I'm ready. 
And then he said, are you absolutely sure you're ready? He was like, really making sure I was ready. And I said, I'm ready. And there he did. He shape shifted out of that energy and he shape shifted it. And so I knew he was the man. And then he shape shifted into who he really was, which was a reptilian. And he was about seven and a half, right, right up to the ceiling, very close to the ceiling, very tall, seven and a half, seven, three, three uh, a quarter or something tall. And he had a kind of a very bright, vivid green color skin, like, like my, uh, um, like, one of the pictures I have of him shows. And is this Ayano? This is Ayano, about? yeah. And I can show you the picture again if you want so you can understand. No, I, I remember it. You okay. Don't need to show it again. Okay. We're good. <clears throat> okay. So, and he, um, and he shows, and he's, I, I start off at his knees because I mean, he's so tall. And I look down at his feet and he's got claws, four claws. And then I look up at his body. He's got this kind of a yellow, a lot, a lot uh, he's, He's like a darker green, almost like a, in my opinion, what a dragon color of green is. And then he has this yellow under, underbelly, and it's kind of like a turtle uh, shell kind of looking, uh, which I, I got instinctively the feeling that it is part of their protection of their um, of their um, anatomy. And then I look up at his face, and he has this very kind face with these beautiful yellow, kind looking eyes. And he's actually kind of not really a grin, but he's kind of pleasingly smile. He doesn't show me ever show me his teeth. And so he sees I see him that way. And I'm a little taken back for sure by him because I don't like snakes and lizards or anything. I'm not as bad with lizards. I hate snakes. And to me, he kind of looked a little bit like a snake. And but I, I realized and I remembered all the unconditional loving energy that every experience I'd ever had was there so i knew it was him and then it was he was good and so later on so in my life he pause, pre- pause for a second okay okay so what you're telling us is that <clears throat> some reptilians feed off our lucias were dying and other reptilians are good i did find out through regression that ayano and i have had lives together where i was actually a reptilian um, also, we've had lives together where I, he was a human and I was a human. So um, the interesting thing about this parallel lives that we have really aren't past and present, it's parallel. We have been all types of extraterrestrials. And we sometimes have been the good guys and sometimes been the bad guys. In those two lives I was, we were uh, in one life, we were being attacked by the draconians actually. And then the memory that uh, in that life, I was his housewife and he came into the, and I had two children and they were reptilian. And he came into the uh, house uh, and he says, um, the draconians are coming. They're going to take the planet. We have to evacuate there. The evacuation has started. And so for some crazy reason, we didn't make it to the evacuation point and I died there. And then the other one was when I was a reptilian, he was a reptilian, and we lived on this beautiful um, um, jungle island. That's really all I know about that one. So I know so, they, so, we interact. I'll pause for a second. Mm-hmm. So is, uh, is he one of your protectors now? 100%. Yes. Okay, go on with the story. All right. So now... Um, Well, Ayano, I find out, okay, that Ayano is there to protect me. And that's what he tells me. He says, I'm here to protect you. And he loves me. That energy is there. I've never, to my knowledge, had any physical contact with him. uh, But I know that unconditional love, that he loves me and he's protecting me. And um, one particular time where in my life now this was i didn't know it was ayano uh at first but i was it was it would have been in the early 80s uh, i was in some kind of a situation where i was going to be in a ritual uh and he came in and um came into my um oh i just never realized i left out such a huge part okay back up then <clears throat> back up 
OK. OK, remember the bus <laughs> where I was I, going I, on the bus. OK, I, I, I think I've actually heard this story. Were oh. you going to the mountain? No, 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 okay. no. OK, so I'm on the bus. So I, I told you about all of that experience. I'm on the bus. I call my parents when I get home. They come and pick me up. And my mother says, for the love of God, where have you been? We haven't seen you since the marriage. My my what? Your marriage, your wedding. Well, now I understand why I had a last name on that ticket. That was not what I knew. I, during this missing time, when I was first taken into this dream program, it's called the driving program, and they put you to sleep for days and weeks at a time. And so I, one of my alters, married, got married to this Navy Marine corpsman. So I'll tell you how that works. All right. So my parents tell me that, the whole story. My mother says that you went to the college uh, uh, and you was checking out the college and we didn't hear anything from you. And then uh, that was in January, like fourth or something. Then <clears throat> then in um, February, we are no late January. We get a, a call from you and you say that you're going to get married to a Navy Marine corpsman, put an ad in the paper, which I'll just show you that so people can see this is the proof. Um, and uh, OK, and so and he's a Navy Marine corpsman and um, you'll let them. No, let me go. OK, so let me go ahead and share this. I can't do the physical things with while I'm talking. So there, OK. So you should be able to see that now. <clears throat> OK, so this was this is me and I told my parents, put an ad in the paper that I'm getting married. I have a name named Corman and uh, we're going to be He's going to be going to college to become a doctor and the wedding will be determined. Um, and so they did that. And then just um, a, a, like a week or two later, they get an announcement in the mail. And that is on the 7th of February is the wedding is to be happening. And so they hurry up and get ready and come because it's an it's the same state, but it's, uh, you know, about. Uh, 80 miles away and so they could come to Pocatello to where the wedding is and when they get there uh, they say that uh, I'm really nasty actually my dad says I'm not walking you down the aisle you only know this person for a month and a half you are not marrying them and I said I don't, I don't care if you walk me down the aisle I'm getting married today and if you don't like it you don't you can leave and then I uh, and I don't remember any of this, of course, and and then I um, get married and have a reception. Oh, and I tell them um, my friends are the ones that got me the wedding dress, so I don't need any of you. So uh, then I get married and have a reception and then they go home. But they know that we have left the state because they contact these people and they said no they're gone so this happened to me so during a regression one time I'm trying to find out how come I don't remember this and during the regression, the therapist asked me um so why don't you let's go to your wedding and I said I don't remember when why don't you remember it's a very important time and then her name is Darlene she comes through she's the all one of my main alters and she comes through and she says because she's asleep like she's supposed to be it's not her wedding, it's mine. And Charlie is the one in charge. You always do what Charlie says. Charlie was the man I was marrying. Um, and I had no memory of it. And so then after that, I was put into a lot. Some of the things I talked to you about, about the different uh, MK Ultra and the being taken um, in, as a courier and being used as a courier and stuff like that, being trained as a beta slave, that all happened through that year. And then the follow, then, then, you know, the following year when I had gotten back home, the following year I was working and I got a call on the phone and I was told, go to Bob's big boy, he'll, he'll be waiting there for you. And I find out 
in regression that uh, I mean, I know I end up missing again for another eight months and this time I'm impregnated at this time one and I evidently give birth because I don't when I'm found by my brother, my parents are looking for me and they find me in San Francisco the first time in Seattle, this time in San Francisco. Um, then they uh, my brother finds me and I have no baby. I'm not pregnant. So anyway, so that's just kind of the, I'm just going to show a couple of things here for you. That's eyes wide shut. That's a lot like what it looked like. Um, I also wanted to show you one other thing. Um, my father was uh, mind controlled, like I said, and his brother was and his brother was a cult leader and he was actually a cult leader that was ha um, put put together by a CIA agent and they were for 10 years in, in California. He was the, the Krishna Venta. And so people can look up that if they want to, but I just wanted to show you that. And my father was a magician. There's a whole lot of stuff I couldn't even talk about today. I is just that, don't have the that, time. Is that an actual picture of your father? It is. Go This one here. We'll go back to the first one. one that's my father. That. That's his. That. Oh. Oh, that's that's my uncle. That's your uncle. Yeah. Okay, Krishna so Venta. You, your uncle's name is? Krishna Venta. Okay. And he is. Give he, us, he is a cult leader, uh, was a cult leader until he was killed in 1958 by a, a bomb by CIA agents uh, that uh, from the Fountain of the World Colony in San Fernando Valley. So he was mind controlled as well. He thought he was actually. Do you know why the, do you know why the CIA killed him? Uh, they were done with him. OK, and, he, and I, he, I cut he, you he, off. You were about to say something. Yeah, he'd accomplished everything he needed to because he proved to people that you could get a cult, you could get a man and people would follow them. People would give them all of their belongings and, and give away everything to them. They would even give themselves to them if they were women. And so they they wanted to know about this, just like they did with. Uh, um, oh, what's his name? I can't think what his name was, the killer. Uh, he was also a cult leader. Uh, Mason, Manson, 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 Manson. Yeah. So, yeah, so that that's with him. And, and then, like I said, he was killed by two men in black suits, black suits and hats and a briefcase. And they took it in there and blew him up. So if I uh, looked him up, I could find reference to him. Somewhere. Yeah, be sure you spell it that way. Krishna Venta. Mm -hmm. OK, go ahead with your next screen. OK, so my father was a magician and he was a hypnotist. And so my father stage hypnotist. It was a stage hypnotist. Yes. And my father would go on the road. This is my sister that saw the US, the ET with him that one time. This was actually the trip that they were on, I believe, when they saw that. And so my father was a stage uh, hypnotist and illusionist and stuff for a long, long time. Um, and uh, he uh, would hypnotize me and make me think I was seeing butterflies. That's why my book is called They Weren't Butterflies. And instead I was being taken to the deacons of the church and rituals and things like that. Um, and this is my sister who was a contortionist and she would do all kinds of acrobatic stuff and things like that during the show. This was my brother right here and then my sister and these two are just other people. So they were so all what on is this. Your, what is your maiden name? I'll give that to you privately, but I'm not going to give you out in public. Oh, that's fine. Uh, okay. you so can, you, can, you can any secrets you want to keep. I'm perfectly. You don't even have to give it to me privately. Uh, oh, no, I don't care. I don't care about it. It's just I'm, I don't I have one sister, this sister right here who's she's uh, five years older than me. Because I was a, I was a baby during this time. So, I mean, you know, I was like she's still uh, around. She's the only one still around. The rest of them have all been killed. I'm not going to say die. I'm just going to say killed. They've all been killed in certain kinds of ways. So I do not want to put my family in, in jeopardy. Oh, that's fine. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, that's the thing right there. That's all the family members that different ages and stuff that they died. So you can have that on there so then people can take a look at that. All right. So then I just want to show you one other thing. So these are the draconians that would take me. Uh, I saw three different types of draconians while there, and they would take me and um, uh, into the 
I think Area 51. And this was the reptoid one that I told you that oh, yeah. I had drawn done of him. That's a reptoid. So he looks, he's different than Ayana. He's a different breed than Ayana. This guy's a different breed than Ayana. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Okay. So you're talking at least three different types of reptiles. Yes. Four different, actually, because uh, Melinda Leslie and I were abducted by this one and when I lived in California. Not, not by this one. We were abducted by military. They came and broke into my house and and took us to in a van and took us to a base and then when we were at the base this reptilian comes into the room and bends down looks in my eyes and puts a holographic me in a holographic experience where my two adult sons and my one son's wife and my granddaughter are there in the room and then these men in ninja black uniforms with big bayonets come in and chop them up to pieces. So it was, and, a, it was a fake uh, event that was put in your head. Yes, exactly. Uh, okay. But before that, I had been in three automobile accidents. I had been countless, um, countless um, threats, threats to my family. Um, one of the automobile accidents was uh, on the freeway where the van pushed me off the road. They were trying to scare me and or and, and there maybe take me out. <laughs> uh, and so um, I pretty much was like beside myself and didn't know how what I was going to do to save my family, especially after that experience in 2000 with that one. So I um, I asked for the council. I asked for help. I wanted to talk to the people who really know everything about my life. And I was uh, I had a council. Now, this is not what they look like. I'm just showing that they looked all different. So I had a council of like nine. Uh, they were all different types. There was an energy being uh, uh, right right there. There was um, a, a human here. There was, um, there was a reptilian. There was two very looking like almost like Jesus kind of people, they wasn't Jesus, but I don't think, but it looked like more, but looked like what I think was Baba G was one of them. Um, and then there were uh, a, a mantid type and there was, um, um, I don't know what that was. It was like a, a cross between, a, um, it was a mammalian. So it was a cross between like a lion and maybe uh, an otter or something like that. And then, and then over here, I don't remember. I cannot remember. I know there was nine, but I cannot remember. There, I, I, there are races, by the way, that have an ability to make you forget what they look like, and no one can ever remember them. So I think maybe that might have been it. So I talked with the council. I went to the council. I was, you know, I was, I was actually, actually, to be honest with you, I was sitting on the edge of a cliff, about ready to go over. You're ready to commit suicide. Yeah. Yeah, I, I said, I, I, I've been there. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. That's OK. Take your time. And. Uh, and they took me to this spaceship or whatever it was, and there I was standing in front of this council. They took you home. Oh, they took you because you needed it. Yeah, they took me because I needed it. I had very, I needed very good. Can, please continue. OK, and so I said to them, I want to come home. I want my family to come home. I want to get out of here. And they said, beloved. In fact, it was the one that looked kind of like Jesus that said it. It wasn't Jesus. I'm not saying it was, but he looked like Jesus. And he said, uh, beloved, do you not remember you asked for this mission and you must complete this mission? And I said, but I can't, you, you don't understand how hard it is here. They're trying to kill me and my family. So anyway, they said one moment. And so they all, it was so interesting because all of their, this was nothing like what it looked like. Uh, all of their seats kind of lit up when they either communicated or talked. I could not hear what they were saying. They were telepathically, but it's like their, their seats lit up when they were communicating. And they... Then came back to me the, the the one like looked like Jesus and he said, "This is what we can do. We can cancel all of the contracts. That is all of the contracts with the extraterrestrials, with the, all of them, 
and that you can still communicate with them later in life in a more astral way, but physically no one will be ever able to abduct you or your family. And I said, yes, I want that. I want it. And so that's what I did. So that day forward um, in 2000, I've never had another physical ET contact, which I've missed, actually. Um, so anyway, so let me just. So you, you regret canceling your contract? I do because I canceled all of them in, in a heat of, you know, just here, let's stop at this. In a heat of emotion, I, I canceled all of them, which means Ayano, who was really my beloved and with uh, my, my good will we won and with uh, the, all of them I canceled. So I couldn't well, hold ever stop have for a second. Mm -hmm. Given you had the opportunity uh, as we speak to regain the positive side of your ET experiences today, mm -hmm. I assume you would take that back as long as you could get just the good side. Excellent. Absolutely, absolutely. I would, in in a heartbeat, I would take that back. But um, that means I believe in block Ayano, and so from that point on, when I would hear, I would hear Ayano walk across my wood floor to my bedroom door, and he would stop right there. I knew it was him because I opened the door and there was nobody there, and so. And I was told telepathically, it's me and you're here and you're safe and I won't ever leave you. So anyway, um, that was the end of the physical contacts and everything like that. Um, but and and it but it wasn't the end of the. The my labs and the government interaction stuff, I still had another. So, OK, excuse me, I stopped everything. So the last time when I went home and I was ran off the road uh, going uh, um, and I had eyewitness account, I have a police report and um, and my eyewitnesses were truck drivers um, and they could not find the van that had run me off. They tried to find it. They tried to see be ahead and try to find it so they could turn into the police. We never could find it. So, uh, so they just got away. But after that, I went back. Um, when I went back to San Diego, I got out of everything. Uh, I took all my books and gave them away. I took all my, because Melinda and I was writing a book about what I ended up writing, which is the, uh, the, um, um, my lab stories and uh, all that. And we had all kinds of people's stories and stuff. And we were right, putting together the information to write a book. So, that's why we were abducted that one night because we'd just been on Art Bell's show and and then um, the two one night later um, they picked they took picked them up picked us up out of my house with by the way they had night vision goggles these these military guys in the dark uniforms so anyway um, so that was the time where uh, I got out of it and so I was out of everything about UFOs for nine years until my mother was getting very ill. I moved back to Las Vegas and I ran into somebody that was in my support group free four because I I'd had support groups since 1990 uh, here at, at Las Vegas for men, women and children and the whole families. And so they said, are you going to start another group up? And I said, I think it's time. I don't think they're after people anymore. I don't think they're going to take me out or my family. So I did. So I got back into it very full force in 2011. And kind of leads us to where I am now. There's a few other things, but that basically kind of brings us to now. I've been doing support groups um, at my home since then, of course, since 2011, and also uh, online. I do um, three groups a week online for all types of different experiences, whether some groups are for just ET experience, some are just reptilian, and some are great experiences, some are star seed journeys, some are galactic light language because I speak galactic language and I, and I, I teach people how to uh, interpret their light language and um, I also um, have a group for MK Ultra. I have a group for the SRA and tar trafficking. I have a group for uh, veterans who are um, 
uh, are have had weird military missing time and they've had interactions with ETs and the CIA and all of that. Um, and I have secret space program groups. I also have um, groups for people who are twin flames, who want to find their twin flames in the extraterrestrial experience and target. And then I have a group for targeted individuals because people who have been through these experiences end up um, being targeted a lot by our shadow government with psychotronic warfare and microwave weapons and voice to skull and all of these things. So those are my groups. So um, the, the secret space program is one. Well, I obviously I attended uh, more than one of your online meetings and I noticed there were quite a few people within the group that you had me in that were secret space program people. Yeah. It was a fairly high percentage of the group that claimed to have that experience. Mm -hmm. So I, I always had a hard time wrapping my mind around whether that was real or not. Mm. Uh, can you kind of uh, oh. give your opinion? Well, I believe it's real because I have experienced it myself. Now, I would take a, a major amount of time and I don't have to go into my small amount of memories with my uh, secret space program. But just to say that I worked with the super soldiers in when they were from age 11 to 18 in some facility. I think it was Mars. Um, and I, I was, shall we say, a, well, it was called Den Mother, actually. I was called, I, w I was called a Den Mother by some, and I was called an instructor by others. Now, I did not instruct people in the art of battle and fighting. I sent them to someplace else, but I was an overall uh, in charge of this group of uh, young men and women from age 11 to 18 until they went out into space and did the secret space program and became, you know, super soldiers. So I was part of their training to help them stay human. I think that's why I was even there. Um, and also to be teammates because before I had gotten there, I was told that they had had a uh, classes, uh, the school class, whatever you want to call it, had been strictly people being a super soldier by themselves and and not not working with anybody. And so I developed uh, a program where they could work together as teams, either two or a group of four, and. We found out that it worked so much better it, with the trials and the and the hologram, um, you know, um, lessons and stuff and practices and everything. So when they were so when they were ready to go and be a super soldier at, at like 17 or 18, then they'd be gone. Now the powers that be were in this was German and there were reptilians there as well. They were the Germans were very happy with the results because the super soldiers would come back more in one piece. They wouldn't all die. Being teammates, they worked together, so more of them came back. It cost them less money to go into rejuvenating them back to life, and you know, replacing limbs and putting more um, um, what do you call it? Uh, uh, cyborg stuff and things like that. So they were very pleased with those results. So I know for me, 100%, that was my experience. So I do believe there is a super secret space program and I do believe there are super soldiers. I was not a super soldier. I was just in that respect. That's all I have memory of. So what, if you had to give yourself a title that's, that's descriptive of what you did, what would you call your your position do in that work on Mars? A principal, or a or the head headmaster headmaster. Like I would a give program my, program manager or project yeah, manager. Yeah, project manager. Yeah, project manager. That would be right. That would be perfect. Project manager. Okay, so uh, based on all the 
therapy you've done, whether it's within your groups or through hypnosis with clients, Mm -hmm. um, give us some overall knowledge that kind of is a pattern that you come down. You don't have to get into an individual story Mm -hmm. or stories even, Mm -hmm. but if you can kind of piece together something that gives everybody an idea of how it all fits together, um, that would be good. Okay. I'm going to give you some examples of sessions and um, repeated sessions. So I have um, I have some people who are an ex-military who have been in Vietnam. Vietnam had an extraterrestrial and a CIA uh, connection went on there. There were weird stuff going on. You do know that under Vietnam there was there's an underground caverns and things like that well now reptilians are part of ones that are there and they're also insectoids that are also there so a lot of military people and were then taken through the military into the secret space program and i'll give an example you walk uh you walk into a room and you're going to be having an interview and they're telling you do you want to help your country do you want to help your world you want to be a space traveler and 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 help others and fight the bad people and things like that and these you know after after probably drugs but anyway they the soldiers say yeah and they say okay sign all these contracts and i sign all these contracts and then they probably give them a glass of water and then they're they're out they don't remember nothing now they're taken into the program and put into the secret space program they are um regressed in oh no they're not regressed yet they're taken and put into secret space program so say they're like boot camp 19 18 years old and they are um they've already as a child they've already been in the programs they've already been in the astral abductions and taken to secret space program anyway but now they're being taken into the super soldier program and they go out into space and they're there for 20 years and they're doing battle or whatever they're doing and then they bring them back and regress them back to the same time that that man was signing the papers in the military and regress them back to that port and so he woke up and he goes uh and the and the, and the brass on the other side it's a it's a guy with uh you know it's like a colonel or something like that and he, he says to him Okay, well, I don't think you're fit for this program, so I'm going to just go ahead and let you go on your way. Um, But, um, you know, goodbye type of thing. So this person has no idea they've been gone for 20 years. They handed right back up that same time. So that's the same way they do it to people in their own homes and everything like that. But this was just to give you an idea of one of the ways they do it. So um, So do you know do you know how? Um, a person is, you know, ages 20 years and then is regressed back to a younger age where they're physically taken back to uh, be 20 years younger? Don't know. It has, it's space, it's extraterrestrial technology, it's time travel, it's... But, but do, you, do you, do you think, it. is it, are they really just taken back in time and they're still 20 years older or do they actually physically make the body younger by 20 years they can physically they, it's very possible they physically make them younger because when i was abducted i was abducted into the my lab program and, and as a um uh, 11 years old i was 11 years old as my first memory of being on board the ship even before I was ended up being that teacher. So that was at 11. And then I ended up, you know, being grown. I don't have much memory, just little bits of memory. I was probably one of the, probably, I was probably this one of the people who were being trained, but I didn't make it into the super soldier program because I do remember being in uniforms and do remember having, having guns and I do remember a few things, but I never was in the super soldier program. So I probably was a failure of that. So they gave me another job. I don't know, but 
<clears throat> but I do believe that they are, it starts from childhood. The MMK Ultra program starts from childhood. If they start mind controlling and programming and programming you to this point, and the altars have to be in place by the time you're 9, 11 years old, because you can go crazy after that. So uh, I do believe that it all connects together. The MK Ultra, the Monarch, the Montauk program, the, the Secret Space program, the Super Soldier, all connects together. And, and I do that because I specialize in trauma release hypnosis in my hypnosis practice. And so I work with a lot of super soldiers, many that are out there speaking, many, many, many men and women who are out there speaking. And um, that seems to be what I've seen as it started in childhood, early in childhood. So if you take the secret space program mm -hmm. and the super soldier program and forget about all the stuff that's underneath it, mind control, MK Ultra, and all that. If you just take the highest level, the, the mm -hmm. Secret Space Program and the uh, Super Soldier Program, where they go off to fight whoever and come back 20 years later, that all, all that, those two top pieces, who, uh, do you have an idea of why all that is happening and what the what the goal is with all of that by the uh, uh, first that's the first question mm -hmm. the second question is who is really running that show is mm -hmm. it uh, a the reptilians or is it uh, the council or how does who's at the very top um, of the hierarchy of running all of that, the larger construct. Okay, I'm going to give you the name here. Hopefully, I can find it. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, inter international in conglomeration or something like that. Uh, <clears throat> um, it's part of Solar Warden. It's part of Kruger. It's part of uh, uh, some of the other ones, and I can't remember all of the project. Let's see. No, no, no. It's it's different programs. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I think I've talked too long. <clears throat> I have to save my voice for tonight, you know. So um, I probably only have about another ten minutes. Okay. Um, so it is uh, it is connected to Earth, yes, and I do believe Earth has been involved in it since the forties, fifties. Uh, it started with the Germans, Germans going over to Antarctica and then from Antarctica, uh, the you know, going out into space. I do believe they were first. And then I do believe that uh, all of our plane makers have had turned into uh, uh, spaceship makers because of the back engineered technology that they got from the, the, sh the ships and such that either shot down or crashed or they made deals with the uh, Granada Treaty and the Greys. Um, so they go up into space and uh, uh, the Germans seem to be pretty much in charge of some areas. Um, there are other, like the, uh, the rep reptilians, the draconians, I mean, seem to be in charge uh, of, uh, of even the Germans. Now that is Kruger, I think, and Nachwaffen. So that would be Nachwaffen, which I think I've been a part of that uh, because of that uh, school and uh, me being that um, project manager of those kids so but other places and stuff are different they're they're part of the corporations so the corporations i think are running the whole space thing but again there are some a lot of super soldiers who have a better information about that but that's my minor knowledge and information about it um ultimately they do want i do believe that um they want to take over the universe, the draconians. They want to take over the entire universe, and, and Earth is just one of them. So let me see if I got this straight. The Germans and the um, the reptilians. Draconians, reptilians. The draconians, mm -hmm. a particular mm -hmm. faction of reptilians. So the draconians and the Germans are, so the, 
the draconians uh, used the Germans as their foot soldiers, and the, uh, together the Germans with the draconians are trying to take over basically the whole universe. And then the other, uh, like the the council, uh, the council that you were taken to, they sound like a positive force. Yeah, that's the Galactic Federation. Uh, Galactic Federation Worlds, Galactic Federation of Alliances. That is a whole separate thing, and they are actually battling the, the corporations that have all these planets and have all this, because people who, like super soldiers, are slaves. They did not really ask to be there. They're slaves. So the Germans have been using slave labor, the Draconians have been using slave labor on the moon. That's where they're at, and the Mars um, as well. And so, but then, but then there's many, many other races of, 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 you know, there's more positive races, shall we say, than there are negative ones. And, and more, and I'll give you this. I have some regressions where I have people who remember fighting the super soldiers and they're part of the Galactic Federation. And they're fighting the super soldiers and the draconians and stuff like that. And then and then in their other experiences, they're the super soldiers fighting the extraterrestrials and the galactics. So there's a war going on up there. And I'm not kidding you. It's a big war. It's a big war. It's a big war for our universe, for our for, um, you know, our planets and uh, our solar system and, uh, and this planet as well. So. Let me, uh, I'm not going to take too much more of your time, but I have one or maybe two more questions. Okay. So, um, so the good guys are fighting the bad guys, the draconians, the super soldiers, and the Germans are on one side, and the Galactic Federation and other alien races are on the other side. And so today we have a um, the U.S. government who, um, by all hook and crook, do not want to release any information that they don't have to. Mm -hmm. So let's take it to the present. Uh, instead of it being like, um, like Stephen Greer says, that it's really um, because of greed only, it's, I'm thinking after hearing you talk, that it's not so much greed that they don't want to release the information. It's because there are too many um, deep holes that that various factions have gotten themselves into that are on, not on the good side, and they don't want all that to come out. 100%. That's my opinion. It started with the Granada Treaty back in 1954, and you know they gave uh, they gave. Uh, humans to be used by with the greys for their deal to get technology um, and so and it's been happening ever since so they would have to even though they felt like they had no choice um, because you know the the meeting with Eisenhower had many different shifts in fact Steven Spielberg Close Encounters of the Third Kind give you a pretty good indication of the meeting that happened for Eisenhower. And they, we, with all those ships and stuff and the big U all big U ship, you rem, I don't know if you've seen that or not, but there's many different ships that the, the Greys came in with. And so when the Greys or the, wherever they were, they, the Edens or whatever you want to call them, Gabe came in and made this, uh, this uh, Granada Treaty. People can look up Granada Treaty and get the whole information about it. Uh, but they gave us technology. We gave them humans, or our government gave them humans to, to experiment on. And they even have their own hybrid program in the deep underground military bases. Uh, they have their own cloning programs. So we, we gave them, carp, or they gave them, the government gave them carte blanche to take as many people as they want, as long as they gave them the names and gave kept them in, uh, informed. The aliens didn't want to be shot at or bothered or anything like that. And that was the Granada Treaty. So they agreed to sell people down millions, I believe. They said it was hundreds of thousands, but I believe it was millions because it's continued on. 
to to send them down the river, you know, to be used and experiment on and, and genetics and everything else. Well, uh, they don't want that to come out. They so don't want that and all the other stuff they've done to come out. I sort of have a, an idea of who has leaked uh, a lot of the stuff recently, and it's not anywhere near official. It's not mm -hmm. the government itself. No. And it's just people it that just happen to, happen to get the information. Mm -hmm. So, um, do you believe that the alien, the good side, the galactic side, mm -hmm. is pushing for uh, disclosure? 100%, I do believe. I do believe they are. I do believe that it's kind of become to a point that it's, of course, you've got the laws of uh, universes, non-interference, all right? Um, the prime directive, non-interference. But if another civilization is in interfering, they have rights, they have a duty that I think they know to um, to help. The only way what people are going to know is if there is a disclosure. Now, the other thing about the disclosure is it could be this um, moon, project uh, Moonbeam, uh, um, a blue beam, project blue beam, where, uh, you know, they might want the false fake invasion. So there could be two things. I think the bad guys want the false invasion. The good galactics want the consciousness being raised. They want the ascension to happen. They want the disclosure to come through the people and through the hybrids and the galactic people that have been born on this planet and are here on the missions, all of us who are awake really are, to help raise the consciousness, at least enough of the consciousness that we can uh, ascend our ascension and, and, and new earth will be formed or whatever it is that they're going to do, not sure. So with the last, uh, just before we get off the air here, um, I'd like you to be able to promote whatever oh. you want to promote. You oh. can show your books. Okay. You can do anything you want for as long as you were on the air. Okay, uh, here we go. Um, let me get it up here so you don't have to go through all the pictures and stuff. <laughs> This is a PowerPoint presentation that I was pulling the pictures off. So, all right. So here is my books and stuff. So I'm going to just pull them up and go back here and share screen. screen. Okay. So. The first thing that came about was this book. This is my covert abduction, military estimate, surveillance, interrogation, and the mind control. That is the answer to the book that Melinda and I was trying to write. I finally finished it, but I only finished it from my experiences in my life. Uh, her and she and I was trying to get all kinds of whistleblowers and stuff into it. But that's my first book. And then uh, my second book is. They weren't butterflies, the monarch survivor story. There's that gate I told you about, and there's the uh, raptor uh, one. And uh, so that tells my whole life story concerning pretty much everything. So this tells everything about it. Um, all my books are on um, uh, Amazon.com. How many books have you written? Uh, here's the third book. And How then many I, books have you written? Three books and two decks of cards. Go ahead. OK, so this is galactic genealogy, planetary origin. My galactics guides told me that people need to know who their races are. So in uh, 2016, I think this has come out. Um, they told me that uh, I need to put a book together that will help people uh, find out that they're not just three types of ETs, humans, greys and reptilians. There's many, many different types of races. There's uh, our government has uh, agreed, uh, the, the whistleblowers in the government have said there's something anywhere between 72 and 74 different races that are interacting with our planet. So that book has a, uh, a chart in it that um, people can use a pendulum and dows to find out what their planets of origin are and then read the characteristics and the information about them. Uh, oh, yeah, that's the chart that uh, 
Okay, and then this was my first book. I wrote this co-author this with uh, Tana Newberry, and uh, this was ET Experience her book, and uh, to help people kind of understand about their own. And these are oracle cards, so you could do readings with them. And this was my last book, which is um, an. Uh, ET experience are unimaginable, and it takes in every aspect, including the um, MI Lab, MK Ultra, Secret Space Program, Target Individual, all of it. So these are inclusive to help people figure out some of their own information and do readings as well. I also, um, this is my group that I have, <clears throat> and I have up to 14 groups a month uh, online. This is my mission, is to help people so they're not alone. I went through my life trying to figure out if I was crazy or not. Um, and so I have starseedawakening.org um, is my website. And from there, you can go to my UFO Nightwatch, um, which I'll explain that to you. Um, on Facebook is where you find my uh, support groups. That, like I said, I have three a week, up to, up to 14 a month. And those are almost free. I've been doing them for free for uh, nine years. This or eight years for the last couple of years I did start charging eleven dollars a month to go to as many as you want to go um and then um I do night vision tours uh vector five was my first name of it but now it's called night watch uh UFO night watch encounters and so I take people out through Airbnb experiences and of course from my website to look at night vision uh, through night vision goggles and I point out UFOs and satellites and we sometimes do CE5s depending upon the groups where we vector in ships that's why it's called vector five so how, do, how does that work does does uh, do they stay at your Airbnb or did you just no. do that? You just no. sell it through Airbnb. I don't have an Airbnb. No, they just uh, it's it's just through Airbnb experiences. They have to go to Airbnb experiences, and there's all kinds of different Airbnb experiences that in each town and city all over the world that people can go to and do. And mine is just one of them. One of the so higher rated. Ones. What site is that that they go to if they want to it's, do that? It's called it's called Airbnb.com. A I R. Oh, so it's the same company. It is the same company. And how do you go from uh, choosing an experience over choosing a place to stay? Oh, no. Uh, I They still have Airbnb ex homes. Uh, Airbnb. They still have Airbnb. Airbnb but, experiences is just a spinoff from their original Airbnb. But it's not a separate website. No, it's the same website. You, ha you have to go to experiences. When you get there, you go to uh, experiences. In fact, there's on the website itself, it gives you information about ex experiences. You just click on that and it takes you to the experiences. Well, so on their main, their main page, there's yeah. the word experiences is somewhere yeah. on Airbnb's main page. Exactly. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so that's, that's, that's it. And I do galactic readings. Uh, I use uh, the galactic cards to give oracle readings for people to help them find out about their own experience and their own thing, uh, journey and such. And uh, I give them a message through channeling of galactic light language and galactic information in, um, transformed, or excuse me, a, a translated. Um, and then, of course, I'm a hypnotherapist. So, so, so uh, you mentioned a couple of times that you've had experiences with or you have connections with Arcturians and Pleiadians. And yes. Have you had physical contacts with those two races? Yes. Uh, not, okay. not Arcturians, not Arcturians, but Pleiadians, yes. Pleiadians. Um, okay. I, um, I don't have a lot of memories about them because you, always, you tend to always seem to go to the ones where you have the most questions. Well, I know that I being one of my galactic most important is Pleiadian. Uh, I'm a, my, you know, origin, Pleiadian and Syrian um, and, and Nocturian. So those are really, uh, I will tell you that one day I, and it was in daytime, um, a being came to me. She had blonde hair 
I don't know, could even maybe show you, but no, I can't show you the picture. Uh, she had uh, blonde hair and she was just beautiful. She was in this shimmering kind of clothing. She was standing there in this energy and she says, oh, beloved Misha, we have missed you so much. And that opened up the gates for me to go ahead and find out about that. So I've also been in the hybrid programs on the Pleiadian uh, um, ship, shall we say, and the hybrid programs through them. Um, uh, really, that's the only human race that I have a, a strong memory, um, you know, of having so, experiences with. Uh, do you think the Pleiadians are uh, are from the physical level of the Pleiades, or they, do you think they're from that they maybe originated there, but yet they've ascended to other levels, and uh, and then now you've met them coming down from say a higher plane or some higher density or whatever, mm -hmm. and that they're back here from there, but they they start maybe they started in the Pleiades, but really they've moved on. Is yeah. that which of those two? Things do you think are the proper? Okay, they uh, started in Lyra. Pleiadians and Syrians, basically all humans, started in Lyra, and Lyra was attacked by the Draconians. Right. Right. Okay. So when when they evacuated from Lyra, they found Pleiades. So they're originally from Lyra, but then they found Pleiades. Now, Pleiad the Pleiadians have been he you know been in this for so long they're all in the higher dimensions as well so they're in the dimensions where they do not need a body or they can have a body they go in up, up to the ninth probably higher even but the ninth dimension that i'm having the knowledge of so i do believe that uh there's physical and there's also have they all I don't know if they've all ascended into the higher dimensions they may have because she materialized right into my living room, so she wasn't physical. She didn't walk through a wall, or I mean, walk well, through a okay. door. So, so maybe so, it's from a higher dimensions. Yeah. So the grays, um, it's my understanding uh, that the physical grays that are not from higher realms, that are from the physical realm plane, uh -huh. are advanced enough to go anywhere they want in the universe. Uh -huh. Just boom from it. They don't need a spaceship. They don't need anything. They can just go from place to place anytime they want. Mm -hmm. Okay. However, the reason why they show up in spaceships is because the spaceship provides a place to, to tie you down on a table and use you as a breeder. So the spaceship is for the breeding process, but they don't really need the spaceship to travel. So, but they're off, but they're from the physical realm. So the Pleiadians, even though she appeared like that, doesn't mean she didn't uh, come from a craft or she didn't just move from her her planet to you in front of you. She could have. Yeah. See what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah, she absolutely could have. Um, yeah, she have, um, cause I, I don't remember being on board a ship with humans, except for when I was with Ayano, I was definitely on board the ship. And I will tell you that the Pleiadians work with positive reptilians with Lyrans with Syrians and with and and of course all the Alturians, but many people, including myself, have seen different. I was on another ship. I should, uh, I should tell you about that one real quick, which was like a mothership. And in that ship, I saw many different types of races. Um, who I was there with, I can't tell you. It's just a memory that came up during a regression. So that, um, but there were many different types there. So um, I've heard. I, I've heard rumors that the, there's a race out there that's on the Federation side that by themselves, without any help from anybody, could wipe out the Draconians without problem if they wanted to. Without without even using the rest of the Federation or the good side, just as a single race, they could wipe. That the Draconians are very afraid of this race. Have I've you heard, ever heard of that. such a thing? I have heard of it. They're the ones that have put the... I, but do I believe that they're the ones that have put the um, the blockade out so that the other draconian scent cannot come onto Earth and and you know and help the the draconians of the here. That's why the battles that are going on with the draconians here in the deep underground bases and stuff, uh, they're not getting any help from outside from their other off 
uh, you know, planet or universe is because this race that you're talking about can do it. But it's again interference. And so uh, they're a peaceful civil, uh, peaceful civilization, I guess you want to call it. But they are like above everybody. I do believe that they're probably right up there with the angels and and God energy and source. I believe they're probably in that because I, I, my opinion is it's uh, that there is a uh, um, hierarchy of even the galactics, which is starts with the source. And I, I don't mean a man, God, but of what we call God in the source. And then you've got the angels and you've got the sending message and you've got um, the uh, um, then you've got at galactics and then, you know, you've got the ETs down in somewhere else, you know, so that's just kind of my my but that's just my belief system on it. And I do have to go. All right. Uh, <laughs> I will stop the recording then. OK, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. I would like to have you on again if you have things that you wish to talk about that we have not discussed. All right. Well, I go into detail on all of them and, you know, that type of thing. So, yeah, so we might. Yeah, we, we can it's do up that. To, it's up to you. Sure. Yeah, all we right. can do that. All right. Thank all you, right. Charles. Thank you.